I'm Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where we amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 169 of the podcast today. So once again, I'm recording out of my home studio, which is pretty much a portable microphone set up on my desk in my home office. Um, (laughs) But we still want to get content out there to you and really good content. Um, So this week, we're actually listening in to the first Collider Online Collision series, which is a virtual series of discussions um, hosted by Collider, of which we are the storytelling arm. This conversation took place via Zoom last week with about 16 different members of the community. We were joined by Craig DeLarge, virtually from Philadelphia. So Craig is a digital healthcare strategist and entrepreneur, and he's the founder and curator at the Digital Mental Health Project. And the Digital Mental Health Project explores how digital technology is being used in the mental health field. So this was a really wonderful conversation the community was able to have with Craig about mental health, about maintaining your mental, emotional, and psychological health during this very challenging time where we're all faced with increased degrees of isolation and increased worries about um, our financial status, the financial status of our business, and our health as well as the health of loved ones. So we had a really meaningful conversation with Craig today about uh, all these things as well as um, how to distance yourself from content, how to distance yourself from all the information that's out there to deal with information overload, how to stay in the moment, how to reduce screen time, and how to use deep breathing um, to maintain some of these aspects of wellness. So we're in for a really great conversation today, so stay tuned for this discussion with Craig DeLarge. So this online collision series through Collider is something that we want to continue. So if you have an idea for um, a conversation that's really pertinent during this time, that's something that would be of great value to the community, let us know your ideas. Send us an email at hello at collider.mn. That's hello at collider.mn. Just as a reminder, you can find our Rochester Rising podcast pretty much wherever you listen into podcast content. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're also on Spotify. And if you prefer YouTube, we put the podcast up on our YouTube channel as well. And we have a new episode coming out every Wednesday. You can find more of our coverage of COVID-19 and how that's impacting our entrepreneurs and small business community here in Rochester on our website at rochesterrising.org. And you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All right, so now on to the podcast today with Craig DeLarge talking about mental health. All right, I think uh, it is 12.05. Mm-hmm. Um, I hate to cut you all off, but I uh, want to be respectful of your time as well. So welcome to our very first <laughs> Collider Online Collision Series. Uh, and really what we're thinking that as we're all uh, at home mostly and um, you know, how, how life can be in this new world. Uh, we want to set up a, a virtual sort of series of discussions that's really open to the Rochester community and, and, and the broader Minnesota community, thinking of Lee and, and everyone as well. Um, so a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, just remember really that today's, uh, first of all, that today's session will be recorded. You should see a little recording button up there. Um, and afterwards, this will be available uh, via our YouTube and Facebook page for Collider, as well as Rochester Rising, our online news source. Um, uh, the format will be basically uh, our, our guests will spend 10 or so minutes sort of uh, giving us a, a presentation, uh, followed by Q&A for the balance of the hour. Um, A point of etiquette, uh, perhaps, Uh, just think about uh, where where there's a lot of audio sources coming in at the same time, and in order to provide the best clarity, uh, please, if if you will, uh, if you could mute yourself uh, while we're listening to the presentation, and then we are going to experiment and, and figure out the best way for people to ask questions. I don't know if that's for people on video, if that's raising hands or how we'll do it, but we'll figure it out because we're very entrepreneurial people. Um, let's see, what else? 
So uh, for those of you that may not know me, my name is Jamie Sunsbach. I'm the Director of Operations at Collider, uh, which many of you may know as a local co-working space here in Rochester, Minnesota, but that's really just one piece of what we do. Uh, Collider is a local nonprofit, and our mission is to support local entrepreneurs with innovative events, education, space, and storytelling in order to foster an inclusive, diverse, and healthy entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and that healthy piece is something that I think we're focused on uh, right now. Um, and health, I think, and especially mental health, is very, very important to our lives right now during this current crisis. And we're privileged today to have uh, Craig DeLarge joining us from all the way in Philadelphia. So... Uh, it's really been great to uh, chat with him here for the last few minutes. Uh, Craig is a digital healthcare strategist, entrepreneur, and founder curator at the Digital Mental Health Project. This project combines his occupation as digital health strategist and his vocation as a mental health advocate and caregiver to produce education, research, and events which focus or facilitate, I'm sorry, a responsible adoption of digital in the mental health space. And with that, we will let uh, Craig take it from here. Okay, very nice. Uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate the invitation today. Um, and I'm going to watch the clock here closely to stay honest on time. So um, it's nice to see, more or less, at least in the list of names, everyone who has joined us today. And I won't spend time going through another introduction of myself. Thanks a lot for the introduction that was given. Um, but I've been asked to, to come today to talk with you a bit about this topic of mental health, um, which has been challenging all the time, but has become even more challenging here in the last few weeks, as many of us are living in a greater degree of isolation. Uh, we're worried about our personal health. We're worried about the health of our parents, our children, so forth, so on. And so it's been really interesting to me um, as one who likes to stay proactive and engaged about his own mental health, as well as my work as a mental health advocate, to be observing and remembering and even renewing a number of different practices that I've had over time when it comes to keeping my mental health and my emotional and psychological health up to date. And so I, I just wanted to share um, a few tips or, or things that I've thought about in this area. Um, so we all know, and I'm actually gonna do um, a screen share right here right now, if this will work, to help out a bit with a couple of points that I wanna make. Um, bear with me here. All right, so I'll go with this one and I hope that you can see this okay. So when I think about stress, and this is somewhat related to um, how we look at and train and develop the educational work that we do here at the Digital Mental Health Project, we like to think about um, triggers, copers, and lifestyle. Um, and excuse that typo there to fix that. So when you look at research and you think about the, the various ways that we experience stress, most all stresses can be grouped in four central areas, right? There's the mental and emotional, which has to do with how we think. Um, there's the physical, which has to do with, um, if you happen to be someone that does physical work, obviously it's gonna be things like how you lift. Um, if you're a caregiver, it will have to do with how you have to run around and pay attention to the needs of others, parents, children, or significant others. I've been thinking a lot about sedentary physical stress. Many of us sit all day long, and in our current isolated situation, where we're not getting up and running to meetings or that sort of thing as much, there's actually an even greater possibility, particularly if you happen to be a bit of an obsessive personality like myself, where you can get engrossed in your computer and sit at your keyboard for many hours before you look up or take breaks. So sedentary physical stress is a real thing that we have to pay attention to. Then there's a social stress related to relationships and then environmental stress. Now, one of the things that we've been seeing um, a happy uh, consequence of this current crisis is that in many parts of the world that had dealt with lots of pollution, you know, in China, India, other places, 
the lack of industry the last months or so have actually resulted in a decrease in carbon emission and thus an improvement in the environment, right? We don't have to deal with that so much here in the United States, but it's a real issue in other parts of the world. But I think for us immediately here in the United States, a consideration of, our, of environment um, is making sure that even though we're isolated in our homes to a greater degree and not going to offices, that we do take the time where we can to go outside and actually experience fresh air or maybe open a window in a house for certain amounts of time during the day so that our isolation actually does not get to us and, and cause us to become unhealthy in that regard. I think that in this period of slowing down, um, and physical distancing, I like to call it physical distancing versus social distancing, because I think more than ever in this time frame, we should absolutely make sure that we don't become socially isolated and distanced, but just focus on physical distancing and isolation where appropriate. But I think that this is a, a real opportunity now as we're slowing down to think about our personal stress triggers that may be we had not taken so much time to think about when we were busier and more active and sitting in traffic and kind of in more direct um, interaction in our offices. Now, as we think about these trigger, triggers, we then have to also think about the various ways that research has proven that we can best cope with stress. And I tell you, for me personally, this time has actually been an opportunity to recommit, frankly, to a number of stress management approaches that I have been neglecting because I've been too busy otherwise. So let's look at these, and there are five essential ones. So relationships. So we know that relationships cause a lot of stress, but we also know that there are all kinds of good strategies and practices and approaches to becoming more skillful and effective in how we engage in relationships. And for many of us, we were already getting practice with our office mates these last few days. And I think this is going to go on for a while. I'm going to cut some of the forward light. That'll be a bit better. Okay. Um, we're going to have a lot more practice actually in relating to our significant others and our children probably more than we want, but certainly an opportunity for sharpening and developing our relationship skills as we're at home. Then we all know that um, as Americans, we are horrible. We run horrible sleep deficits, but this is now a, an opportunity and a time to actually check in on our sleep habits and how we could be using this time when we're not sitting in as much traffic to actually maybe get in some extra naps or to go to sleep earlier or to maybe sleep a little later when we don't have meetings. Then there's diet. There's a huge temptation at these times for us to put on what some people are calling the, 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 uh, the physical distancing 15. I've heard some people call it the COVID-19 15. Maybe it's the COVID-19 19. The point is that extra 15 to 19 pounds that we all are going to be tempted to put on just as a function of the fact that we're sitting in the house and the snacks are right over there. And we can keep going to that uh, cabinet and pulling things out. Right. I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day who was telling me that she had bought about three weeks worth of um, reserve food in the house and that she, her husband and children had gone through half of it in four days. Doesn't bode well, but certainly speaks to the idea that we need to pay, be very mindful and pay attention to how we work out stress in how we eat. And as a result of that, creating the right habits, and even social supports around us to hold ourselves accountable around how we deal with stress uh, with better diet versus worse. Then exercise. Tons of research shows that one of the key ways of, of um, dealing with um, stress and avoiding depression or alleviating depression and anxiety is just through exercise. Maybe a better term to use is movement. For many of us, when we hear exercise, we think, I'm not doing that. But if we just think of it as movement, then we're more likely to do it. So I'll tell you that um, I've made a recommitment to my yoga practice 
doing Qigong, going for that 20 minute walk every day, uh, getting in the floor and doing stretches. And not only do I do it for myself, but I've got social communities or people who are colleagues and friends of mine where we work on this together. Um, and so it's important to think about that. And then this fifth area often gets underestimated, breathing. Some people might call it relaxation, but the ability to feel and understand what's happening in my body where I'm tight and kind of clenched up is coming from me worrying about my income, the projects that got canceled. Um, how are we gonna get through this? And there's a need very often during the day to, to take that deep breath down to your diaphragm and your belly. This is a time where mindful breathing is probably one of the most immediately available and important means of coping with stress that we could be using. And it's also an opportunity to model it for our children and frankly, to teach our children through modeling and instruction, these good practices. So we see the opportunity in these times. Now, and I'm looking at the clock, um, so I, I know that I'm running short here. So now let me look at this third area. So, because we do work at the Digital Mental Health Project in the area of how digital technology can be leveraged to improve one's ability to be resilient in the face of stress and to recover from mental disorder, we obviously have to think about digital lifestyle, something that we all have, but which few of us acknowledge. The fact is that the combination of the devices that you use, laptops, smartphones, tablets, it could be your car. If you use Android CarPlay, it could be your Amazon Echo. It could be your Oculus Quest VR lenses. These are all devices that make up our digital lifestyle. Then there are channels, email, chat messaging, social media, so forth, so on. They make up the channels of our digital lifestyle. And then finally, content, whether it's news, conversational, inspirational, educational. These are all forms of content that we develop preferences for. Now, when you take into consideration and I want to get to my next slide here. Uh, come back, come back. All right, here we go. So I'm going to wrap up here and we'll get into Q&A. At the Digital Mental Health Project, we develop what we call stress tech literacy approaches. We believe that there's a woefully low understanding of how digital technology can be used to improve versus damaging our mental health in the current society. We believe technology is just a hammer. It's a tool, it's neutral. You can build a house with it or you can break a window with it. We think we've been breaking too many windows with tech. We need to start building more houses and the house of our health in particular. So when you properly assess these three areas, your triggers, your coping habits and your digital lifestyle, we believe that every person can come up with a personalized stress tech portfolio that actually supports their maintenance of healthy stress levels. And what you see here is the collection of particular stress technologies that I use personally in various areas for relaxation to breathing, meditation, and caloric tracking or diet um, that help me with maintaining my healthy stress levels and being resilient in the face of what was already a stressful life that has only become more stressful as a function of the COVID-19 crisis. One other thing I'll mention, service I think is very important at this time. And particularly for those of us who are doers, who are feeling rather insecure about the limitations of what we can do. So. Find ways in your community, in your virtual community, to be of service. A couple of suggestions that I've been doing. I've been watching lots of congregations and mental health support groups tempted to shut themselves down because of the need for physical distancing. I've been offering my expertise as a Zoom meeting facilitator, reaching out to congregations and mental health support group facilitators to help them with learning 
and then producing the types of meetings that we're on right now to help those communities maintain contact. Another idea came across my email the other day, um, and I'm gonna wrap up on this point for Q&A. Um, there's a shortage of personal protective equipment we know in the, in the country right now. I used to sew when I was younger. A friend of mine has actually looped me into a group where we're going to be sewing masks for healthcare workers in our local hospitals here in Philadelphia. I can't go out, right? But I can use skills and knowledge that I have in communities in order to help in little ways that help the larger community. So think about your current sets of skills and experiences and the communities that you're in, your church, the community, your children's school, your family, and how you can be virtually or maybe even physically at a distance offering that this is a way actually of having a sense of meaning and purpose and usefulness that goes a very long way in helping us to be resilient in these stressful times. So I'm going to stop it that, um, stop sharing. Actually, I'll leave my screen up unless you want me to take it down and handle some questions that might be coming through. Yeah, no, definitely feel free to keep it up. I think, uh, I think it, you know, Zoom does its magic and transitions to whoever's talking. So thank you so much for that, Craig. That was a, that was a relatively free, challenging, I'm sure, a relatively compressed period of time you had yes. to present. So thank you. Um, and uh, we have a couple questions. So for those of you who don't have the chat open, uh, we did uh, request, and thank you, AJ, for that, that, um, that people uh, could submit some questions in chat. So maybe we'll start with some of those questions. Um, I would actually prefer not to just read the questions, but have the people asking the questions to engage. Um, so I'm going to call on you, Aaron, uh, if you want to jump on and actually uh, ask your question. Sure. So I, I had two questions. Um, on the first slide, uh, the bottom left then circle was uh, stress copiers. I was just curious if you could explain that term. I'm not familiar with Yes, it sounds like stress multipliers. Yeah, so let me let me ask for your forgiveness in that that's a typographical error on my part. It's okay. really stress copers. <laughs> so gotcha. these are the five uh, fairly standard means of effective stress coping and stress management that you find in the literature pretty consistently. Gotcha. Okay. And then my second question was, when you're talking about diet and, and as, as it relates to sort of the sleep deficits that Americans run, uh, um, my question is, does caffeine use and abuse play a role in exacerbating sort of anxiety uh, and you know, also having a problem with um, keeping people awake longer than they should? And as a society, should we be thinking about our caffeine use during this time? We absolutely should. I mean, caffeine is a stimulant. Um, one might say that it's the counter to alcohol, right? So alcohol brings us down, caffeine um, stimulates us. And many of us have adopted a habit of caffeine consumption in, in our current society, just as a way of being able to meet the daily um, requirements of performance. But I think that during this time, when we are more sedentary, and not in need of as many calories, continuing to consume caffeine at the rate that you had been can make you quite anxious and worked up, which then makes it difficult to relate to people. It makes it difficult to sleep, right? You see how all these things kind of interplay with one another. And so, yeah, I, I think that there are a lot of people who are going to be in withdrawal, but I think that's also an opportunity uh, to be more mindful and to frankly use this pause period to correct some things that we maybe have been sloppy about uh, when we were doing so much running around. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Yes. All right. Uh, I, I'm assuming the next question is from Amanda, who is also logged in as the Collider Foundation. Um, it was. Amanda, are you there? Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> My question uh, for you, Craig, was do you have any strategies to suggest for kind of staying in the moment? I know a lot of people who deal with anxiety, that's what you're always told, stay in the moment. 
yeah. you know, and it's really hard now when you're thinking about, oh, what could happen? I mean, that's why people hoard stuff too. Yeah. So what are some strategies? Yeah, so two that come most immediately to mind uh, without you having to go out and buy any new technology. So I have a wearable that helps me with that, but that's another discussion. I can send you a blog post about that. So um, breathing, the, 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 most, the most handy technology that we have for coming back to ourselves when we find ourselves worked up, uh, depressed, or distracted is... Breathing brings you back into your body. It triggers your parasympathetic nervous system. And one of the practices that can remind you to do that is bells. So there's an app that you could go download that I use. It's free, actually, called Insight Timer. It's one of the top meditation apps that are out there. Some of you might use Calm or Headspace or other things like that. They're also helpful. But you can actually set up random bells that when they ring, the bell reminds you, pause, come back to myself, come back to myself. And so I'll tell you again, that is the, the, the handiest, most readily available way of remembering to come back to the moment and to focus on What's happening now? How am I feeling now? What can I do now in this moment? Because what I do now takes care of the future. I'm either doing things that are healthy now that make for a healthy future or things that are unhealthy in all of these areas that I talked about of coping. I'm either healthy or non-healthy and that sets up the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. So I hope you find that helpful. It's, It's simple but difficult. Simple to explain, difficult to execute, excellent with practice like most things. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Great. Um, I think our next question comes from Paolo. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we talk about a, a food diet, but understand we also need to adopt a healthy content diet as a part of our digital lifestyles, right? The fact is we are content obese. And our obesity, when it comes to content, has the same negative effect on our health as with food. If I eat too much, I become obese and unhealthy. If I consume too much content, and particularly unhealthy content, I then become obese in that regard. And so I will tell you that you should have a period every day where you take a break from content um, and from information. Um, For some people that requires going out and walking or sitting down in meditation or going and doing a workout with the television and the tablet and the telephone turned off. Um, I will tell you that if you're addicted to information, it's very anxiety producing to be away from it. (laughs) The, The same as if you stop smoking a cigarette or, you know, you get my point, right? Uh, But this is important. The other thing I think during this time is having um, what's called media fasts. So I will tell you that when I get overwhelmed, a habit that I need to enact in order to regain balance personally is what's called a screen fast. So the same way you do intermittent fasting, you, you, um, you can eat eight hours a day and then 16 hours a day you don't eat and it makes for better health. Screen fast means that at certain times of the year, at seven o'clock in the evening, I turn off all screens, all screens, including television. I have to read books or meditate or maybe have a conversation with my children and my wife, right? (laughs) And I cannot look at a screen for any reason unless it's a life and death emergency, obviously, until 6 a.m. the next morning. When I first started doing this, I thought, this is rubbish. There's no way this is going to work. Plus, there are too many important things going on in the world for me to deprive myself. Like, the society could collapse if I don't look at um, my screen from 7 until 6. But I was amazed at the transformation that happened in my nervousness, my being worked up, my ability to sleep a full night, 
I was sleeping three hours a night. I thought it was because I needed to be busy at work. I didn't realize that it's because I was overwhelmed with all the information I was taking in. As a result of that, I did that for about two weeks, actually. I didn't get through the four weeks that was recommended, <laughs> I'm, I'm sad to say. But even in two weeks of following that regimen, there was a transformation in my ability to concentrate, to relate, to think. My performance at work began to go up in ways that where I didn't realize it had eroded. Um, I highly recommend that as a way of dealing with information overload. We have to get past our FOMO, our fear of missing out, as they call it. So I hope you find that helpful. Great. Um, any other questions? This is where it's going to get fun. Um, okay. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, feel free. And if no one unmutes themselves. <laughs> I guess I had a uh, sort of a question more about the digital health project um, and how you came to be involved in that and, and sort of the background on, on, on that just a little bit more. You know, sure, mind. Sure. Yeah, so I have to tell you that the digital mental health project for me is an interesting combination of my occupational expertise and my vocational calling. So for many years, I've worked in the pharma industry as a digital health strategist. Um, helping pharma companies with figuring out how to use digital technologies to better deliver the various therapies that, that the industry produces. Simultaneously in my life, I'd had the unfortunate circumstance of a very dear loved one being diagnosed with a very severe mental illness. Um, it's not something that I wish for, but it happened. The re my response to that was becoming um, an advocate and an educator with a local chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It was after many years of working in both of those areas on a parallel track, one during the day at work and the other one in the evenings and weekends as a part of my volunteer and, and board work, that I got the idea during a sabbatical to bring the two together. So I started doing research around the intersection between digital um, technology and how it's applied in mental and behavioral health. That research went, turned into conference talks, which turned into innovation challenges, which is now turned into a consultancy where I do work with um, entrepreneurs and provider organizations and has now extended into uh, literacy education where there's a big gap in the market around um, doctors and consumers understanding how the technologies that they're already using every day could actually help them to achieve better stress levels if they're on the wellness side of the healthcare system or to recover from mental illness if they're on the clinical side of the healthcare system. And so my wife and I have been spending a lot of time developing this content um, developing models around it. We even have an assessment that you can take that then helps you to come up with your own portfolio um, and getting out into communities that can make use of this because we believe that there's the potential for a broad transformation in how we use this technology as a hammer that builds things rather than a technology that breaks things. So, Craig, I've got a question about uh, the the impact of shelter at home or stay at home policies now in the states, how's that impacting community groups, kids, uh, and not people working from home, but in general society? And what are your, uh, what's your best guess as to how that's going to evolve and, and will there be social manifestations of disorder and this and that as a result of cooping everybody up at home yeah. and the authorities ask people, what are you doing out here? And, you know, that kind of pressure, psychological pressure, there's nowhere to go, nowhere to spend money. I, I got my $1,200 from uncle Sam. I can't spend it anywhere. Yeah. So that will re, that will basically reinforce the lack of, of whatever freedom. Yeah. And people might sense and I don't know how that's going to be manifested uh, socially. Have you had any, any thoughts or ideas? And the second question I have is, 
what about these mentally ill people who in normal times you've been helping and yeah. how are they coping now in the special situation? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. And by the way, um, I'll try to remember uh, a friend of mine sent me this article from Politico a couple of days ago, where a number of writers have been venturing guesses at how the world is going to change as a result of COVID-19, which is quite an informative read. But, but let me succinctly uh, address the two questions that you asked. So one, I think that whatever our current mode of thinking and behavior is, as individuals and families and communities, this crisis is only going to amplify it. So however I'm healthy, I'm gonna become more healthy, more in community, uh, more reliant on um, whatever I think the divine is, um, more prone to exercising and you know these sorts of things. However, if I have a lifestyle and a mode of mind that is unhealthy, initially, I, that's going to amplify. So I'm going to eat more poorly. I'm going to become more suspicious. I'm going to become more isolated, right? I think, though, that for those that will, by default, initially become more unhealthy, there is an opportunity for we as individuals to self-realize, check in on ourselves, and then to change some of those habits and mindsets. But I think even more importantly, because health is social, there is an opportunity for we as communities to look away from our computer screens and look more at the people that are right around us, down the street, in our churches, our community centers, in our homes, and to figure out how to be compassionate and available and to use this as a way of rebuilding community. And I think that you're gonna see both simultaneously. You're gonna see people acting out in ways that are destructive and detrimental out of their distress. And you're also going to see people, and by the way, it will be the majority of us, even though you won't hear about it on television, right? Who are actually going to be more compassionate, more helpful, more giving. And we'll get through this. I've been thinking a lot about my grandparents who talked to me about the depression and the war years, right? And how they got through it. I've been thinking about the financial crisis of 2007, 08. I've been thinking about 9-11. We've been here before. The fact is we'll be here again, but good times spoil us. Difficult times bring us together. And I think that as leaders in, in our respective communities, we got to work with that. Now, your next question, as to the, those that are mentally ill, well, it's going to get worse. Again, I think we're going to see a lot of suffering and we're going to see some tragedy as a function of this. There will be an increase in suicides. Um, there will be a further increase in depression and anxiety. Um, already you hear about local public health um, authorities forecasting d d increases in child abuse, increases in domestic violence, just because of how people cope with uncertainty. But again, as communities, we're gonna have to come together and be available working with social infrastructures, I'm gonna call it, right? Some people think that should be the government, some people think that should be private organizations, whoever it is, we've gotta come together to protect um, our community and those that are most vulnerable in order to get through this together. There's a, it's a tragedy, but there's a real opportunity in it. And most of whether it's gonna be one or the other is gonna be about how we as individuals choose to engage. And I'll remember to send that political article over. I'm gonna put it in my notebook right now so I don't forget. Okay, next question. So uh, we have a question, uh, it's on the screen in the chat from Lindy. Um, she's curious if you could elaborate on other ideas, building on what you were just talking about, uh, for service to others while staying at home. Yeah, yeah. So, so I talked about kind of taking time to look at what your, what your superpower is, right? My superpower is teaching technology facilitation. So as I thought about that, um, um, superpower and how it was immediately lacking or damaging my local community 
churches and mental health support groups, right? This is the formula that I use. I then begin reaching out to people who I know are responsible for those types of scenarios to offer myself. Um, I talked about the sewing um, that I hadn't done in 30 years, but I can remember how to use a sewing machine well enough that if a, when a local hospital says we need 100 masks produced by um, seamsters and seamstresses in our local community to help us out until the government does whatever it is they are going to do, I can put myself to work doing that. Um, you've got a big call right now in many local communities for people to deliver groceries or to deliver medication to the elderly who can't come out, just leaving it on their doorsteps, right? Um, eventually, I, f I fret and fear we're going to get to a point where many of we as non-clinical citizens are going to be called upon to actually assist with the handling of what I'm going to call basic healthcare needs in communities. So think about your expertise. Think about the community that can use that expertise. And think about your own level of what I'm going to call health risk. So I'll tell you right now, being fully transparent, that I'm in a debate with my wife. I want to go out and do Instacart and Uber Eats in order to make some money because all of my consulting projects have dried up now to get some cash coming in and to be a system in the community. My wife is not having it. <laughs> She's not having it. Her thing is that's dangerous. You might get infected, so forth, so on. That, um, that negotiation will continue. But my point is, it's important to be very clear about the level of risk you want to take with your health in order to be of service to your community and to properly negotiate that with the people in your life who love you, care for you, you care for them and who rely upon you. Because we don't want to be of service out there in a way that creates undue anxiety and distress in our very homes, right? So that's a point of wisdom. Um, I haven't sorted that out yet. I'm going to keep working on that with my wife. Don't be surprised in a couple of weeks if you hear that I've actually gotten out there and, and made myself of service outside my home. But I think that we know that just being on social media, you can hear it, on social media and making a few phone calls in your local community, people will tell you what the local needs are and they will continue to evolve. Just be mindful and available that we all have superpowers, we all have ways of contributing, we all have expertise that we've developed over many years. And as a way of having a sense of control and meaning that is a protective factor when it comes to your mental, emotional, and psychological health, that sort of engagement is something that's available to you. And I don't think that there are enough people in our society where we have become more consumers than citizens, I'm afraid, in the, in the last couple of decades, we tend not to think in citizenship terms as a default. We tend to think more in consumer terms, which is what can someone else do for me? We need to get back to being citizens, which is what can I do for the community that I care for and that I exist in? This is gonna be really important to helping us with managing our stress. Next question. I'm, I was hanging out here to see if anybody would jump on. Feel free. We probably have time for one or two more questions. Okay. Oh, let's see. I'm somewhat bemused at the uh, uh, alacrity in which in newspaper articles about the shelter in place orders that in the first uh, two or three paragraphs, there's and the liquor stores will remain open. Yeah. Well, as you know, unfortunately, liquor is one of the top drug industries that we have in this society, um, for better or for worse, right? And I think that we also know that in crises like these, there's always a struggle around what's essential 
And what part of the economy do we need to keep in place versus not in order to face the crisis? And so we're seeing all kinds of battles happening throughout the United States right now uh, at the federal, state, and local level around what I'll call economic versus health decisions. Um, and, and that's going to be a patchwork that we're going to continue to see kind of roll out. Uh, once again, each one of us are citizens who have the power of communicating with our representatives about the priorities that we want to see carried out in our local communities. And so I will tell you that I happen to be um, associated with a Quaker meeting here in Philadelphia. And I think you know that for the Quakers, social activism and social justice is a big priority. So one of the things that they do as a group is they give us the materials that allow us to more easily write letters and petitions to our local representatives, as well as federal and state, about issues that we feel are important to us. I think that another point of service and empowerment, regardless of what your political persuasion is, is to advocate for the particular positions while you're sitting at home, right? <laughs> advocate for the political positions and the social cultural priorities that are important to you. Even this is a way of being of service and of being active and doing meaningful, powerful work at a time where we can do little else. Next question. We definitely have time for probably one more. All right, and if there's not another question, I, I, have, a, I, can, I have an exercise I would like to, um, to put forward. Should I go? I'm all for the exercise. <laughs> So here's the thing, we all know about the knowing doing gap. If you're a human being, you suffer with it. <laughs> we know what to do, but very few of us actually do what we know we need to do. So I wanna challenge everyone on this call to write down one thing, just one thing that you're gonna do differently from this morning to this afternoon over the next two weeks. And when you write it down, you're not going to just keep it to yourself. You're going to give that one thing to five other people. They're either in your house or they're on your work team. Actually, it'll probably be a combination of in your house or your work team at some important community institution, you know, a church or a you know, the rotary or whatever, right? But people who you feel accountable to and you're going to ask them to help you because the fact is few of us make any significant change without social pressure. <laughs> so it's important to write down that one thing, give it to five other people, and then in two weeks, check in on how much better you feel, how much less stressed you are, how much better connected you are, how much better a citizen you are as a result of one thing that you do differently. No, that's amazing. That's uh, I actually, I just wrote one thing down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's huge. Um, all right. Uh, so thank you all of us or thank you all of us. Wow. It's been a long day already for me. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, special thanks to, to Craig for taking time to educate and enlighten us about this really important topic during this crucial time. And uh, Craig, where can people find you and learn more about what you do? Uh, so I'm pretty easily found at um, digitalmentalhealthproject.com. Simple as that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, everybody. Make sure to follow uh, Collider and Rochester Rising social media channels for upcoming events like this over the next few weeks. And uh, for those of you that are members of our co-working space, uh, you can also check our Slack channel uh, where we'll be promoting more great events like this. So uh, again, thank you to Craig and uh, you know, stay safe, everyone, and have a great day.
Thanks so much to Craig for taking time out of his schedule and joining us from Philly to have this very important conversation about mental wellness and how to best maintain that during this time. Again, we hope to have more of these online collision series moving forward with Collider. So be sure to uh, subscribe to the Collider social media, subscribe to our weekly newsletter, which there's a link or there'll be a, uh, yeah, there's a link in our show notes that will direct you to the newsletter to stay up to date and be sure you're subscribing to the Rochester Rising social platforms as well, where where you will get updated on that information. And if you have ideas for an upcoming online collision series, let us know. Again, send us an email at hello at collider.mn. As you know, um, Rochester Rising <clears throat> is a storytelling arm of Collider. Collider is a 501c3 based here in Rochester that believes that Rochester ideas and innovations have the potential to change the world. And we support entrepreneurs through storytelling, space, events, and education. As of last Friday, we temporarily had to shut down our co-working space to comply with Governor Tim Waltz's executive order. It was a really sad time for our team at Collider as we've been proud to serve our members and community for over three years. During that time, Collider has welcomed over 100 entrepreneurs, freelancers, remote workers, small businesses, and nonprofits to the co-working space. We've also connected our community together with impactful events and educational sessions like Startup Weekend and One Million Cups. And most importantly, we've been able to get to know so many amazing members and sponsors in our co-working space that make each day fun. So Collider has decided to pause memberships during April for the co-working space and move to a pay-what-you-can model. This was a difficult decision as the fixed costs for the months of April still have to be covered. Uh, so of course, we're everyone's impacted during this time and Collider's impacted as well. We have costs that we'll incur no matter what. We partnered with Friends at Forgiving to create a donation campaign to raise funds to help cover our costs. We actually had recorded a podcast episode with Forgiving on Friday, March 13th, hoping to air that soon, but uh, some of this content was just really important to get out, Um, but look forward to that podcast with Forgiving, hopefully somewhere in the near future. Um, But anyway, Collider has a donation campaign through Forgiving. And if you're able to, if you're willing to, if Collider or Rochester Rising has impacted you in some way, please consider donating to our campaign. The Forgiving team is being very generous and covering all the costs associated with these donations, including credit card fees for campaigns. We want to thank you in advance for being so generous. And you can find um, links to donate in our show notes, or you can go right to collider.mn slash donate. That's Collider. C-O-L-L-I-D-E-R dot M-N slash donate. We're looking forward to being back in our co-working space as soon as possible. Until then, we're working hard to support our entrepreneurs virtually through our online collision series, which I talked about today and which we shared that content with you today. We also volunteered our time to develop the Roch Strong app, which we've also continued to share this content um, from the app on Rochester Rising. Roch Strong is a web-based application that is able to put all the ways to help the community in one spot, including um, new business hours of operation since everything has changed, um, new services that the businesses are offering or methods of services and best ways to help and get in touch with those businesses all in one place. And of course, we encourage you to enjoy our online content through Rochester Rising. So again, if you are able to donate to Collider during this time um, and have found value from services offered through Collider as well as through Rochester Rising, please consider donating at collider.mn slash donate. That's a wrap for our podcast today. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen in to your podcast content so that you never miss a story of entrepreneurship and innovation coming out of Rochester, Minnesota. We'll see you here next week with a brand new episode.